Hey everybody, it's Quicken, and today I wanted to talk about something a little more serious, and before we even get started in the video, I just want to make a trigger warning for anybody who may be affected by certain um, keywords or instances, so there will be um, drug mention, suicide mention, uh, depression, and anxiety mention as well so if any of these mentions are triggering to you i do recommend either proceeding with this video with caution or um maybe watching it later with um someone with you i just wanted to mention that before we get started in the video last night i found out that someone from my hometown had um died and it really got to it really got me thinking about all the things that have happened in my life and how grateful I may be for certain circumstances that used to um, weigh really heavily on me and destroy me. So I just want to get started and I want to talk about how my depression may have actually saved my life. So when I was younger, about 14, my first boyfriend uh, broke up with me. And I've always kind of told myself, and I kind of say it in jest, but I think that I was like a very late bloomer and I jokingly say that it was like ugly duckling syndrome and that I was <laughs> really ugly and weird until I got older. And when my boyfriend and I met, we both lived in the trailer park and it was, it was nice and humble and like we would read manga together and I don't know like go to the movie theaters and not even sit next to each other like go with friends we were pretty young and one day he stopped talking to me and he started hanging out with a girl who was like more mature like wore playboy bunny belly button rings in like her ears like playboy bunny was her aim icon just somebody who was a little more grown up than me. I remember feeling so left out and stuff that I really tried to hang out with that crowd and I really tried to be mature and stay out late and I stopped hanging out at the bookstore and started hanging out more at like the cyber cafe, things like that. And I always felt really ostracized and really left out and very young for being 14, 15. And I would say that along with everything happening in my life, when I would go home, I couldn't sleep at night and I couldn't eat. And I'm not saying that it was directly, obviously it wasn't directly related to the breakup, but just feeling like I didn't belong in my body and that I didn't belong anywhere because I feel like it's really similar for a lot of people. It was, people were growing up around me and I couldn't understand why the things that I really enjoyed were my follies and what kept me young and kept people like making fun of me and teasing me. But I still had like a core group of friends. I guess like as school proceeded, I really just wasn't interested in class. I really couldn't motivate myself to learn. And one day, um, I was coming home from school and there, when I got a phone call from my mom who, and she said the police were at the house. So I came and the police said, that someone had called in an anonymous tip that they thought that I was in danger and that I was a risk to myself and that they thought that I may hurt myself if I was left alone. So the police took me and the police took me to the hospital and after like a psychiatric analysis from professional, um, I was put in a hospital for a while to kind of just get back together, learn some tips, and like figure out what was really wrong with me and why I was feeling that way, why I couldn't sleep at night, why I couldn't eat, 
they put me on like a special diet and they gave me a lot of tools to uh, reassimilate after school was done and after my hospital stay was done. So for a while I was going to school in the hospital and it was a special school for people like me but I didn't make any friends while I was in the hospital and my friends on the outside really ostracized me and didn't understand what was going on and why I was in the hospital, like if I had tried to kill myself. And there were a lot of rumors going around and I would say, well, not say, but... So none of my friends visited me while I was inpatient in the hospital. And while I was there, they were testing a lot of different medications on me and they'll tell you that when you first start going on an antidepressant, there is a risk for your depression to get worse. And for me, that seemed to be the case. And when I got, after my stay in the hospital and in the special school, about two months later, um, I was put back in my regular school. And they told me to tell everyone that I went on a skiing trip. But, as you know me now, I'm not really into sports, not really into skiing, and the school that I went to was really class divided, so everybody knew I lived in the trailer park and I wasn't on a two month <laughs> vacation in Aspen or something. So it didn't take long for me to get back to school and for people to figure out what happened. And I started experiencing a lot of bullying and people messaging me, telling me like, I wish you would have killed yourself, all that stuff. Um, and it got so bad that the police actually had to come and take my computer and um, figure all that stuff out. Which sucked because it was like my house computer, so I felt like really bad for my parents and stuff too. After all of that kind of died down, and not really died down, but after you face it long enough, you kind of have to figure out what you're going to do. And I started hanging out back downtown, back at the cyber cafe. And, you know, my like first boyfriend was there and he was hanging out and a lot of people welcomed me into that group of friends. Not with open arms, but if I sat with them, people would talk to me. Um, and a lot of my other friends, like I said, like didn't understand what I was going through and why. And I would say that I was really um, ostracized because of that. So some of my best friends kind of turned their back on me. And I was kind of left with hanging out with my ex-boyfriend and his friends. So I would say this was a time when a lot of people were experimenting with drugs and as a person who was so conflicted with like a very deep and penetrating sadness and one that I had to fake through and pretend I didn't have and pretend that I was skiing just so people would let me hang out with them. Um, this probably would have been a vulnerable time for me to start using drugs, but I was so socially inept at this time that I didn't really want to do drugs around people. Smoking and things like that were such a big social thing with this group of friends that um, like sometimes I would smoke and stuff, but that was about it. I would say that I was experimenting with drugs at this time, but it was more in a very like self-medicating way which I don't recommend. I'm not, I'm not encouraging this behavior at all. This is just a part of the story. I was smoking and I was smoking at home, but my insomnia was so bad from my depression or whatever it was that I would usually smoke to fall asleep. I would say as the years went on, this group of friends became very established as like stoners and listening to Sublime and Bob Marley and wearing like very appropriate like stoner garb and I think it was just very clear who they were and what they represented but I never really fit in with that form 
like I said, like, I was still pretty immature, like, still really underdeveloped, still just, like, not wearing makeup, not wearing, I don't know, not wearing nice clothes, like, still wearing all the clothes that I wore from, like, elementary school, I swear. So I never really fit in with a lot of these kids, but I didn't really have many other people. And I would say the other group of friends that I originally had who kind of turned their back on me with my, um, after I was hospitalized, a lot of them didn't approve of me, like, smoking and stuff like that. And I became ostracized furthermore from a group that was punk. And I feel like punk kind of stands for, like, supporting and, um, understanding hardship and things like that so it was for me i really didn't understand where i fit in in this big picture because i wasn't like this stoner kid i wasn't a rich kid i wasn't even allowed to be with my punk friends who i guess you know you're punk so you reject the system but there's no room for sadness and there was no understanding of sadness in this group and me being depressed and not being able to get out of bed sometimes and not being able to leave my house really did not make sense to them. And often I was left behind, I wasn't invited, less and less, the I wouldn't know like what diner they were all at, things like that. People wouldn't pick me up anymore. So I really lost my place in everything. And even to this day, I attribute a lot of myself to being punk and the punk group that I was in, but I never forget how much they turned their back on me when I needed somebody. And I never really liked to party though. I didn't really like to drink. So I would say that it may have been a blessing that I wasn't completely involved in all of that. So when I got to high school, I felt like I carried a lot of this stuff with me. A lot of the being ostracized, not really fitting in, no one really understanding why I was sad, no one really understanding depression and how I acted around a lot of people. Which was honestly, you know, wanting to be alone, wanting to stay home. I was hanging out with this kid for a while and him and I would like listen to sad music together and things like that, but he was a lot more social than me. And it felt like we were dating for a little while, maybe like two months. And he told me like specifically that I wasn't his girlfriend. And I would say that this was really painful to me just because I didn't understand why I couldn't be and why I wasn't good enough. Because we hung, we hung out all the time, walked together to class, ate together at lunch, we would go to the city together, but always with a reminder like, you're not my girlfriend. So the summer that I was 17, I met this guy and he used to play guitar um, in our town and you know, have the guitar box open, the guitar case open for money and stuff. And he worked really closely with the local record shop, which I was often at, I would say music played like such a comforting role in my life. And me growing up is a little different than maybe somebody growing up because I would say iTunes wasn't really a huge thing and I didn't like, I don't know, I didn't have a debit card so I couldn't order things offline. So going to the record shop was huge and I know that it's like, not as huge now. I know that that record shop like currently suffers because it's not a thing. It's a thing of the past, honestly, but I was going to the record shop a lot, almost once a week. I had so many CDs. I would buy CDs and I had a big radio in my room. I didn't have like an MP3 player then. No one did. It was like 2007. Um, so I usually saw this guy like at the record shop and he was a little older than me. And when he told me that he had seen me around and like seen me with my head down, seen me sad, um, told me that he noticed me a lot, 
it was really flattering to me and like really exciting because this guy was a little older, like four years older, um, you know, played guitar, pretty handsome. Um, and he just had like a mysticism to him that was super exciting to me, very appealing. So when we hung out again, it was really exciting to me and such a change of pace. Like someone who was like genuinely interested in me and someone who had like something about them, just something poetic. He lived, he had his own apartment. And I remember he bought me um, a beer, like a 40 ounce, and we drank on, we sat on his roof and drank the beer, and I'd never really drank like that before, so I was like instantly drunk, and it was something that I novelized so much, because you hear of these like writers, and they're in so much pain, and they drink, and they drink, and you romanticize authors like Charles Bukowski who just drinks and drinks and you think of like Connor Oberst and you're like that's the same pain that I feel and that's how I feel and that's how I socialize myself I'm subtracted from everybody else and I don't understand and I feel like drinking on his roof connected me to all of these people and it satiated a sadness that I had and I wouldn't say the sadness went away, but I felt very connected to it and I felt like it was a part of me and not something that was hindering me. I spent the summer trying to chase that feeling and this guy, I mean, we weren't supposed to hang out because I was only 17. It was illegal, you know. And the way he would treat me, he would call me in the middle of the night, um, I would have to go to his house, uh, I wouldn't hear from him for weeks, and I always blame myself because I didn't understand why I wasn't good enough, why someone couldn't be proud of me, why I had to be a secret. And when the, the last time I'd heard from him, he showed up at my house in like the middle of the night and when I woke up he was gone and I walked to my friend's house who lived in town and I sat on her porch until the sun came up and I didn't want to tell her what happened but I just felt so deep, deeply hurt that someone would come into my life and give me some sort of understanding and then leave. So I spent the next year kind of drowning in that feeling and I wouldn't say it was a longing for the guy but just a longing for someone who could help me understand myself and it took me years and years to understand but there was so much comfort in the sadness that I felt because at that point it had been all that I knew. I went through high school without a lot of friends. You know, the one guy who would never call me his girlfriend. Uh, I ended up going to prom with him as people, not as dating. And I felt like I graduated alone. Like, I didn't go in like, a big senior week. I didn't, there wasn't a huge party at my house. Um, I just graduated and that was it. And... When I was 18, my parents asked me to move out. And I understand the generational difference, I really do. But in 2008, when I was 18, I couldn't move out. I didn't know where to go. But you know, when my parents were 18, they moved out. But I didn't really have a place to go. So I stayed with friends while I could. Um, you know, moved to Texas, as some of you know, and when I hit absolute fucking rock bottom, I came back to Pennsylvania. I had a little bit of money, and enough money to afford a place with a roommate. It wasn't a huge step, but it was something. While I was gone, the original group of friends who originally ostracized me, um, had 
all become so addicted to drugs that you would see them and you would hear stories about them and you just couldn't believe it. And I felt like I had dodged a huge bullet. And our one friend had overdosed and died. And she had lived two streets away from me. I had remembered the grade she came to our school and everything and any warmth she'd ever shown me and she was dead. And I thought, you know, if I was more beautiful, if I was more understood, if I wasn't so depressed, if I wasn't so sickly, would it have been me? A little bit of time went by and I ran into the guy who I'd met when I was 17. And he stopped me and he talked to me for a little bit. You know, he said, come back to my house. Like, I mean, I've got my music set up. Like, I have a new house, come see it. I had the afternoon free. I figured, okay, hadn't seen him in a while. I'll engage him. I went to his house and, you know, he was like, sit on my bed. I was like, no, um, you know, no. He was like, you know, I came out with this album and, you know, track number five, that was always about you. And I was like, it's not. It wasn't. It never was. You know, you held me at arm's length for an entire summer and you confused me and hurt me emotionally and I was like that song is not about me and he said please you know please keep me in mind please give me your number so I gave him a fake number and later on he contacted me like through the internet probably myspace and he said why did you give me this fake number like I was genuine I was reaching out to you like fuck you like I was trying to be so nice to you and I was trying to pick it back up and apologize and you gave me this fake number, fuck you. And I've always felt really guilty about that and, you know, advice I would give to myself today would be like, good for you for giving that fake number to that loser. Because I hadn't seen him for all those years and when I was at his house he told me that he went to a trip to France and while he was in France, he became addicted to heroin. And, you know, I thought about the times when we were on his roof and how we were drinking away, any miserable feelings I'd felt, and I felt so connected to being an artist, and I felt so connected to my writing, and I felt so connected to all of these writers, these artists, these composers who reach this empty feeling and they fill it up with alcohol and they fill it up with drugs and he tried to make it seem like his trip and his usage was the next step the next the next romanticized way to touch this sadness that lives inside of you and to satiate it and to help it grow and you know I said fuck off and I thought you know if I was more impressionable if things would have been different would it have been me I had what if what if I kept in touch what if I went on the trip with him like would it have been me um last night I, uh, I got a text message from someone from my hometown saying that he had died. He died last night um, from an overdose. When he got back from France, he had gone to rehab. And they say if you use after you get out of rehab, your tolerance is really low and it's a really likely chance for you to overdose and that's what happened and although it has been years since i've spoken to him i attributed so much to our experiences together because i learned that 
my sadness was infinite and that it was ceaseless and that it was always with me and I felt so comfortable inside of it and that it had created a shelter for me and that it was these walls that protected me and it kept me in my house and it kept me from making mistakes like the kids who exchanged their their joints for needles and it kept me away from the punk kids who had no understanding of anything different than them and it kept me away from the rich kids who didn't want me to belong and now that I'm an adult and now that I choose my own path like my depression isn't cured and my depression is untreated but it holds value to me and now more than ever I feel like it saved my life all the time that I spent you know in my room with the lights out all alone never understanding why I was in so much pain they those nights protected me from a subculture that I thought I belonged in but destroyed all the people around me so today last night more than ever I'm almost grateful that I was a sad kid and that I stayed home on Saturday nights and that I didn't ever use like, like recreational kind of drugs like that because all those kids who started with like just a cigarette in the alley they're dead and I don't have a Facebook but every once in a while I get a text from somebody that said you know blah 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 died and blah 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 died and I thought I went to such a great high school and you know my parents brought me to a town where I could go to a great school and so many people from my graduating class are dying from drug overdose and I only have like my social anxieties to think because they kept me weary and they kept me fragile and they taught me how to say no Thank you so much for this story time video. Um, I know that it is a little depressing and dark, but I just wanted to kind of show that there is some value in being different. And although like my sadness can cripple me and it keeps me in the house and sometimes it hurts so much that it turns into physical pain, I feel like today, I feel pretty blessed and I'm happy that it all came together and that today it kind of all makes sense. So thank you guys for listening, I'm really sorry um, if you couldn't watch this video because of the drug mentions and um, I just wanted to share a little bit, uh, leave a comment down below. And, um, I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you so much. And I love you guys with all of my heart. Uh, it took a lot to say some of this stuff. So take it with jest. And please just, please be safe. And if you ever, ever feel like something is wrong, Please seek professional help. I know it may seem like my time being hospitalized never did any good for me, but it gave me the tools to understand. And I'm grateful all the time for whoever called the police the night that they said that I was unsafe because you never know. Um, 
So yeah, I love you guys. Please be safe out there and please be careful and make the right decisions. And if you ever need help, please, please get it.